Well, <laughs> how are you feeling? Because I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit weary now. We've just been talking for like three days, nonstop. Well, but, uh, well I have an affliction that uh, is progressively getting more challenging. It's a complex issue. I've been like this for about five years, mm -hmm. where uh, it, the the uh, nervous system situation, which I I figure interferes with my being able to walk comfortably, mm. and it comes and goes. Right. Is that and like so, a sciatica type thing? Or? Well, it's a it's a myoplasm. It's something more uh, primitive than a virus, mm. and uh, I first. The first time I got a problem was called sciatica. Right. It was quite uh, uh, painful. It was my lower back, and of course, uh, the pain. You can appreciate why a lot of people uh, get so desperate as far as pain is concerned. Eleven Canadians die from overdosing on on uh, op the, yeah. uh, the that sort Opine of stuff. And, well, and, and I, I am uh, I, the only time that things are painful is when I'm walking. So if I'm mm. sitting still or laying down. I don't have a problem, but the uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, when I got this condition, the medical establishment had no idea. They took x-rays and everything. We say, we can't account for your pain. You haven't slipped discs or you haven't, haven't got anything. And then one day, uh, by luck, when I was maybe a year or so into having that, there was a British doctor on the CBC, and he proposed the idea that there was uh, uh, this myoplasm which they are beginning to recognize. Since uh, since then, I think, uh, I try to keep track, there's about 150 myoplasms that you get. Right. You know, there's uh, myoplasm that you can get from horses that can uh, put you into a very profound uh, depressed state right. and so on. So this myoplasm attacks the uh, myelin sheath mm. around major uh, axons on nerves, mm. And, and, and the body overcomes it, then it moves to another uninfected axon so it w uh, wanders around your body. It's been, um, you know, uh, about a half a dozen places from right. the instep of my foot to, to uh, the, 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 the most recent one was the hip. Mm. And that really interferes with my ability to walk because every time you take a step, you get a stab of pain. Mm. You're firing that axon, mm. and that's what it is. But it's getting milder, and it's going somewhere else. And hopefully, it'll be something where like <laughs> doesn't interfere with my walking so yes. much. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, I so, so. Yeah. I've restricted I, my walking has been so restricted that I probably would be wise to do some physiotherapy. Mm. Uh, but I'm loath to bother. Mm. I, I have a file on Stephen Hawking. Yeah. And uh, he died a year or two ago yes. at age 74 or whatever. And I said he endured all his life. Uh, you know, in that sort of condition. But what he got, he, I think he was possibly bitten by a Rocky Mountain spotted fever tick. Mm. And uh, the result that paralyzed him, but his IQ quadrupled or quintupled. So mm. probably without experience of that, he probably would have, yeah. he had to bite the bullet and yeah, say so that really. the reason I'm Stephen Hawking is that some creature bit me and I became <laughs> five times more intelligent than normal. <laughs> and I became a I guess, super mathematician. Yeah, and, I guess we kind of have these tales of people like Spider-Man who get bitten by a spider and they get certain superhuman powers. But I guess that's just another superhuman power, isn't it? The, yeah. the, but it's not a physical one. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he lived to a, a good age, despite what the doctor said. So, yeah, well, yeah. despite my problem, mm. I, I expect that I... All my all my brothers and sisters are sure to live till the mid-80s. And uh, I've got seven more years to go if I get that long. <laughs> so, so if I'm smart, I'll get a lot done yet. Yeah, yeah. So how old are you now, Moors? Yeah, I will be 79 in October. 79. So I guess yeah. I'm 78 and a half. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so can we can we rewind a little bit? You you might be a bit bored with talking about this, but you, you know we're at the Global Bushcraft Symposium. We're honouring you know people like you and Dave Westcott and Tom Luchens and Lars Fall, those of you that are the grandfathers of the subject that you've passed so much on to so many other people. Um, we talked a little bit uh, time to time about uh, Tom, your, one of your mentors. Um, could you? Could you explain a little bit how you and he first met and first started 
uh, interacting? Well, I decided to become a writer somewhere in high school, which meant that I said, oh, I, it would be neat to write, therefore pay attention to uh, uh, the, you know, the spelling and, mm -hmm. the, and the grammar and everything to do with writing, you know, and so on. So, but it took a while for me to zero in on what I was going to specifically write on. <laughs> I, um, well, the, I aspired to write in the area of medicine. Hmm. So I had an older a, a doctor who was eight years older than me, he became a doctor, a brother, an orthopedic surgeon. And I was quite intrigued with medicine. So when I went to university, I didn't attend to my studies. Instead, I read in the medical library right. to the detriment. So I, so I went to university, you might say six years, until the university caught up with me. And then uh, they said that you have shown no direction in your studies. Uh, you are not to register this university for, for, for the next four years. Well, Wow. I would have probably gone another few years because I was going to university would give me the opportunity to bone up on uh, the uh, uh, subjects area, subject areas that I uh, were, uh, was going to write in. Mm. One area that was very uh, lucrative was True Confession magazine. So, <laughs> uh, and so you write to the magazine and you say, uh, uh, what are your parameters, what, what do you want? And they'll say, well, create a problem that involves uh, women from 13 to 38 and create a problem and solve it. That's the story. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, they just couldn't get enough writers to fill the magazine. So as a result, the quality suffered. But they paid very handsomely. So I was going to write for them. So I figured I better bone up on psychology, sociology, and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. on human nature. But in the end, uh, I came to realize that I was very intrigued in, in wilderness living skills. Uh, well, survival was sort of not a common term uh, in, in those days, and there were very few survival manuals. So uh, I collected all the classical books. Uh, Ellsworth J. Gear, for example, he wrote four. Um, well, I just have to stop and think. I have a whole list. Mm. And these books I borrowed from the library or if they were acquired by sale. And, uh, and then I, I became very intrigued with scouting manuals. And I, uh, I lived in a country school. And when I could have joined scouts, I did, we, there was two of us discovered that there were a lot of scouting materials in the basement of the school, where, country school, right. and we devoured all that knowledge, including, t, you know, learning. Uh, we, were, I, we went as far as semaphore and stuff, but anyway. So you were out in the yard with flags. Yeah, okay. well, well, the situation was, uh, the three of us, we were in a situation where we might have, you might have said we created our own scout troop, the three of us. And we went to the extent that we would say outdoor ed wasn't something that was sort of incorporated in there, but we, the knots, the, the mm -hmm. everything to do with scouting, the mm -hmm. information was there. Uh, there was um, a display case in the local city, everything a scout could buy, and we, when we applied to buy, and they said you have to prove you're a scout before you're allowed to buy the these, <laughs> really? uh, you know the scouting uh, logo. And, and had that. you been involved in scouting ever? Oh yeah, yeah. I joined. So uh -huh. so uh, when uh, I moved to the city to go to high school, and the very first thing is I joined uh, the Boy Scout troop. But I found I got very disillusioned after while uh, being, uh, you know, uh, your grade eight. What is it? Eight and five, thirteen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I come off the farm. Mm. I have a saddle horse. I have a real saddle horse. <laughs> I can harness horses and mm -hmm. I can go in and harrow and plow and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I drive a truck. Uh, the, the rule was that 
A farmer didn't have to have a driver's license if he drove the gravel truck from his residence to the local uh, elevator. I drove the truck occasionally <laughs> because I was, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Well, well, the issue is that I, I did everything as, as, as a man, and I joined a scout troop, and they're playing these games of the grommet with the mm-hmm. stick, and they, and they discourage you wearing your uniform. Right. And I joined to do on and on, on, and then a scoutmaster... Uh, he was relatively young, and he he didn't help matters because I, he he took me to task uh, for the fact that when I, I thought the the other scouts uh, would enjoy having a walking staff, so I cut staffs, mm-hmm. and I still remember clearly how he ripped the. Uh, uh, the strip off of me both sides for desecrating the forest by so cutting, for cutting for cutting the wood for yeah. cutting and I'm right. saying well that's my father's farm I didn't cut this in a park huh. whatever but he he had that sort of conservative mm. um, uh, uh, thing but he went a bit overboard and of course the scouting movement sort of said no more campfires we have to use packing backpacking stoves and on mm. and and I'm as I matured. I said, I don't teach campfires to create a fire scars. I teach because so many kids are injured by fires. So you should learn and, and you should know how to use a fire. And that if you know how to use a fire, the abuse is not really yes. uh, the, the sort of thing you encounter. It's people who don't know what they're doing. It's a little bit like you learn to drive a vehicle properly. So other, otherwise, you don't say you can't use a vehicle. You teach them how to use it properly. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, uh, I'm in the mode of of collecting books that sort of relate to the outdoors, every outdoors mm-hmm. book, which the, there might have been about 40 or 50 books. And when I met Tom, I, I owned, I had that library, and uh, I drove by the the uh, uh, gate of the uh, survival school. So the training begins in Edmonton, and then about three, almost 300 miles further west, that was the activity area. So when the students were finished with all the classroom work and everything, then they went and would spend maybe two weeks doing uh, the, the building lean-tos and, mm-hmm. and learning all the other stuff that uh, you have to know to do well if you find yourself in the bush. Well, when I drove by the, the gate, uh, I came to the realization that uh, the word it was survival school and somehow that word school grabbed mm, me mm-hmm. it's like sort of uh, uh you know I, I never thought that maybe there was such a thing as schooling in that in that area and and the signs were so intimidating because I, I maybe too many people would turn into the into the and there was signs like no trespassing out, or, yeah, and you yeah. got the feeling that you better not go down there because they might shoot you or yeah, something uh-huh. so i drove back past that uh, in, in my uh, work as a welfare officer to this community that took me past the the uh, school and when i asked people in the local community about that they knew that it was there but they really didn't uh, uh, tell me what i was looking for and finally one day uh, here's uh, a person wearing olive drab like a uh, military uniform, but no uh, uh, badges or anything. And when I got closer, uh, on his epaulet on the shoulder was civilian survival instructor. Mm. And that was Tom. Right. And uh, the situation was, when we started talking, I, I, I think I remember right, we talked for six hours. <laughs> we talked <laughs> on that corner, uh-huh. talked, and talked, and talked. You know, we should have gone for coffee, coffee but we yeah. just started to talk and talk. <laughs> well, anyway, Tom is like, he was like starved to talk to anybody, whereas his co-workers, it was an eight to five job, and right. they really weren't fired up about a lot of the stuff that Tom was intrigued with. So here's a, here's a young man who's really keen on what he has to share and what he has to offer. Yeah, well, yeah. well he's, uh, uh, he's been, he was, uh, had been already worked for, for the survival school for 18 years when I met him. I mean, you were the young man and he was... Yeah, yeah, well, well, I'm I'm 12 years younger than Tom. And uh, and, and in our discussion, you know, what's survival all about? What's what we do? Mm -hmm. You know, so so he's answering a lot of questions. And then at some point he says, well, do you know how to light fire other than with matches or a lighter? And I said, well, uh, I I have the literature. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, but I actually haven't. So one of the very first things we began to work on is to light fire by friction. Right. And uh, it took months before we started to succeed. So was that, did you go to the survival school with him or was that off site? Well, what happened was, uh, was that uh, shortly after I met Tom, the government built an outdoor education uh, facility uh, with the intention of teaching teachers more on, on, you know, skiing and hiking and everything. And the facility was situated in the wilderness in the idea that uh, uh, people who uh, want to recreate in the wilderness, this is where to go. And so Tom, and the, the interest in survival was that Tom and I would double up. We told the people who were doing booking, you know, book two classes and, uh, and we will double. And I'll, uh, uh, my training would be to watch Tom demonstrate all the techniques he would know. And after a certain point, I would be able to be independent of them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, for example, axe. Uh, you know, I came to the situation a fairly skilled axe user. Mm-hmm. But when I first saw Tom describe the issue of safe uh, handling of axes and felling and everything, I was blown away because I totally understood what he was saying. Mm-hmm. That is, whereas the, the kids, the cadets that I brought from my corps, they, were, they, they, they had already spent a night and they're all asleep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't appreciate, you know. So you the, were getting the full were, benefit. Yeah, I, I was, yeah, I'm looking around and I'm the only one that, you know, which was uh, uh, kind of uh, valuable for me because it won't be very difficult to, for me to acquire uh, the, the ability to, to do the same as Tom in mm-hmm. act safety and falling because I, you know, I was a surveyor and we've cut trees. I was brought up on a farm and I, I had the arrogance to think that, that I was a true axe man mm-hmm. before I had that sort of training. And I was lucky in my life that, that I never did something to the extent where the axe would have made my toe long, toes longer or shorter, depending <laughs> on where you had your boot. Or, or It's a common thing to chop yourself in the forehead yeah. if you don't know what you're mm-hmm. doing. <laughs> I've come across people who've implanted axes in their, in their feet. Yeah, And one guy was really lucky. He managed to get it. I'm not, not, not one of my students. I was at an event and I, I found this guy and he had his foot up and he put the axe between his big toe and the, and the next toe, like right in the middle. So he was maybe made both of those a little bit longer. But, uh. <laughs> well, I saw a knife accident where uh, we were at a, we were building a, a structure in the bush for the community, kind of a play, a playhouse, and we made benches to sit around the fire. And one of the guys stuck his knife in the bench. Mm. And a girl, you know, a woman, one of the co-workers, she was wearing flip-flops. And she stepped over, didn't see the knife. And she drove the knife between her big toe and that Mm. as she stepped over. And there was the knife blade facing Mm -hmm. her. That was kind of a spectacular, bloody accident Mm. there. I've seen many many accidents in connection with... uh, working in a, ja- a project uh, a dam. As a, I was a surveyor that put in the shoreline so that the people who clear the, 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 the trees and everything that are going to be underwater, and then there's a, 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 a thing connected with the dam. It's called the skimmer. So any logs that are floating down the uh, river get caught up, and then there doesn't get into the turbines. Right. Well, they hired like 200 native people to the, the, the sides of the, of the um, uh, uh, between the skimmer and the actual dam were very steep. So here, uh, 200 native people are felling all those trees on that slope. And there would be an accident every day. And I was, happened to be near there. No first aid kit. <laughs> so the, and when they found out that I, I seemed to have a little bit of uh, knowledge uh, you know, they're wearing moccasin rubbers. They drive their axe. There's nothing to stop. My, my um, boots, which we use, they were specifically uh, particularly used for uh, using climbing spurs. Right. I liked those sort of boots for a reason. That sole saved my feet many times because you glanced it and the stole, sole would stop the pr- progress of the axe. But with a native person wearing moccasin rubbers and moccasins, it's a uh, you know it's a severe cut because there's nothing to slow it down, and and when I I, I would uh, I would just wrap the moccasin 
and the rubber, everything. I wouldn't take any of that right. off. I wrapped it tightly. It's a hospital is 50 miles away. Mm-hmm. One of the guys that hauled the victim there, and the doctor says, is that a med student? <laughs> <laughs> I do that. Don't fiddle with that. Let right. the doctor unravel yeah, yeah, yeah. because the clot and everything is going to stop the bleeding and make yeah. it tight enough so it doesn't uh, leak very much mm-hmm. and send it to the doctor and let the doctor unravel all that. And, and so on. So they, they thought I must have had some medical knowledge. <laughs> so I, but anyway, I, I, at the university, instead of, instead of uh, focusing on my studies to get a degree, um, I, I was virtually uh, living in the medical library, reading so that I became quite, you know, one of the intentions was that maybe uh, I would be a writer, a reporter in, in the matter of, of modern medicine and whatever. Did you regret not studying medicine? Did you think I should oh, have applied to medicine? Well, I tried, uh, but I wasn't enough of a scholar, and thank God right. I wasn't accepted. Mm. You know, We often say that the best survival instructor uh, is probably got a degree in medicine and is married to a nurse who's an emergency room nurse. But, <laughs> but, but I, I've had many, many doctors and at one point, I, I taught over 600 nurses from the northern uh, regions with the, the, the federal government, uh, the National Health and Welfare Services. They service all the Indian reserves and all the territories, mm-hmm. and there was about uh, four or 5,000 people in that department. And uh, there was a thing called the Hartwell Affair, where um, uh, a pushy British nurse, Judy Hill, uh, had a patient who was suffering from appendicitis, and unless she was evacuated from the territories to Edmonton, the nurse felt that she would die from mm-hmm. the appendicitis. And Hartwell said the conditions are well beyond my means, but still, the, well, she said, well, you know, it's going to be on you that you're... And she didn't understand what flying is about. She didn't listen to the pilot, and of course they crashed. And uh, uh, Judy Hill was car- uh, was uh, killed on impact. Uh, the uh, patient, I think, like a couple weeks later, and she brought her nephew as a company, and he died five days before Hartwell was rescued, and Hartwell was rescued in 48 days. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed the, SAR- uh, the search and rescue technicians that actually... Um, you know, evacuated him, and his his uh, ankles, uh, legs were so broken, and he survived because he had so many sleeping bags. But you know, when he got to go to the bathroom, he couldn't go, and mm. he, he just had to go to the bathroom mm. right there. So it was quite a mess mm. by the time he was located. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I've got a big file because I tried to. Uh, Tom provided me with all mm. kinds of literature where the Sartex would be debriefed, so you had the intimate details mm-hmm. of, the, of the rescue, and you might say. And how did you find that informed what you teach? Was there, were there common themes that came out of that? Were there things that you thought, we need to teach things in a certain way as a result of the information that was coming in from the Sartex? Were you that methodical about it, or was it just more of a mm. background information? No, well... Uh, uh, and I, I, well, uh, maybe uh, freeze the question again. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking you were getting this information and you were building a file. Oh, on, yeah. Well, on, you, know, on you wonder. You know, did you, did you, that inform yeah. what you taught and how well, you taught Well, it? If it, you know, someone would come down in a crash, uh, well, it'd be good to find out, you know, what would you hope to have mm. known yes. to uh, to make things better for you? Mm-hmm. Well, in Hartwell's case, he had so many parkas and, and sleeping bags that he didn't have to maintain a fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, well, I don't remember at the moment exactly what kind of climatic conditions were involved. But when I had the health and welfare nurses, well, of course, there I had to, uh, you know, create a syllabus that, uh, that would be, you know, we... We imparted the type of uh, knowledge that they should find useful should they be, uh, you know, building a lean-to or, or, or the, the nature of the fire or getting fires going. It was uh, like a four-night program mm-hmm. uh, that every nurse uh, and, and doctor and uh, a dentist and public works people who were involved in flying uh, uh, Judy Hill was the fourth nurse that uh, died in an airplane crash, nice. so they decided that they were going to have that, and um, and I got the student. Well, first of all, they hired 
uh, well, personnel from the survival school, and they were so brutal treating the nurses like they were military people. Mm -hmm. uh, that course, uh, uh, the, the course, the, the students mutiny. They just picked up and went back right. to the center right. on the instructors, mm -hmm. which caused them to fire the instructors, and then they approached me, and can you take over? Well, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, by then, they had run quite a number of courses. So there's only one uh, nurse from each nursing station, of which there might be, you know, uh, more than, there would be three, four, six. And when those nurses that they initially took, they went back and they spooked the other nurses who didn't want to come. Because right, right. those they nurses like, that experienced it, that training, yeah. I almost died. You're not going to yeah. enjoy that. <laughs> and so after that, they, they're, uh, they're coming at the course unwillingly, but the mm -hmm. department says, you have no choice. Mm -hmm. You have to take the course. Well... Well, anyway, uh, Tom and I, we, we, we sort of uh, uh, understood that you, the people, if you, put, you serve no function by making people absolutely miserable until they have had a chance to be able to take care of themselves uh -huh. in a way. Why are you uh, causing them to be so uncomfortable? Well, these, uh, these uh, the, uh, office, you know, the, 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 the sergeants or whatever, um, they, uh, they were too brutal. Mm. Well, it was good because I got the job. So then or, you were building skills before you were testing them? That's, that was the kind of ethos? So sort of rather than just beasting them from the beginning, you... Well, you sort of built them put, up before put the, testing this. Well, put the students into a comfortable uh, situation, which they didn't. Mm -hmm. Tom, Tom suggested I build a camp that would house the class. Mm -hmm. So, so I, you know, so I built uh, shelters that were heated by stoves, which is easy to heat and uh, comfortable, and lots of things. As a matter of fact, I even had uh, you know. Uh, reading and, and that there were people that were kind of, I said if you come unwillingly uh, and you, you you find that you'd rather just sit and read and wait till the course is over but it better not get back to the center right. that, that I provided you I said I don't want to force an unwilling person to do stuff there were people like that but there were also people that really looked forward to the most austere mm. sort of stuff. They really, uh, you know, th that was their their thing. So I would uh, uh, build these facilities that were easy to heat. And when we vacated with the previous course, the stoves, the kindling, or even if the stove was cold, it the kindling was put in the stove so you didn't have to you you just lit it mm -hmm. well i'd keep it secret to make sure the staff at the center didn't know i had this camp and i when when i got the the students to the camp i said this is the story this is the way i see it take on whatever you feel you're comfortable with regard to uh, you know some people that was the thing they wanted to do is, mm -hmm. is build the lean to and so gradually we began to uh uh, accumulate a village to accommodate twice as many uh, people as, as was there. And, and, you know, you go to 60 below. Well, yeah. 60 below is brutal. Mm. And you you don't actually do very much outside of that temperature. You do a lot in the shelter, the warm, heated shelter. And so the students are like getting an insight in the way the native people would mm -hmm. live uh, with wood stoves and being comfortable and everything and so on and then we'd go back to the center and the staff there would say oh it's 60 below we can't get our vehicles going uh, we, we're freezing to death just to get to work how the heck mm -hmm. do you people manage you look like you, <laughs> you don't have <laughs> we sort of like well the students the students uh, took on exactly how much challenge they wanted mm -hmm. and and they were happy that to to um uh, you know, not uh, let word get out that we yes. had a comfortable camp yes. there, and uh, and so on. So, well, anyway, like the course, uh, you find that when you're a survival instructor, uh, if someone dictates what you should teach, a guy like me says, "Well, mm -hmm. well, you hired me as a survival instructor. If you want to dictate to me what to teach, you teach, teach it." it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I would immediately say that. Your concept of what survival is about mm. might be such that 
because there's a lot of people figure well it must be universally the same mm. and they and they apply unex, you know um, uh, expectations that are unreasonable mm -hmm. you know i mean they're hiring me because maybe the company says i should get a professional to teach it, and they turn around and figure they should tell me how to teach mm. and uh, and that that the, you, know, you, you might try but you you as an instructor it, it interferes with your uh, you, you, if you're hired as a survival instructor, uh, anybody dictates uh, it might compromise your professionalism or whatever yeah, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, true. You know, I mean, we try as hard as we can to be, um, uh, you know, responsible and rational and and do our best, but we don't need to be trying to teach someone else's sort of stuff. It, it didn't happen very often, but it happened often mm. enough where where the people would say, "So, so they phoned me." And I say, Ella, uh, I said, do you understand that uh, if you're I I into uh, dictating what I teach, you'll have to get somebody else because mm. I'm not the person who gets dictated to. Yeah. So you've well, always liked the freedom to, to develop well, your own syllabus. Well, the, this person, he's, uh, you know, the conditions and the climate and the actual, you know, all kinds of things participate. And, and you might end up being taxed severely from your professional knowledge to deal with. And he's telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I might not feel comfortable that what he's telling me to do is not the right thing, yes. you know, sort of thing. Yeah. So. Well, too, anyway. too rigid a framework yeah. to work I, within. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I might not be. I might not know what I'm talking yeah, about. No. <laughs> little question: You mentioned the three of you forming your kind of own little kind of private scout troop. Who were the other two? Well, there uh, we were in the same grade. Same we grade. Were, yeah, we were. Um, you know, we were boys the same age, yeah. and uh, uh, there was a girl, but she didn't. Participation. He was in the same grade. Yeah. You're in a, a, a country school, elementary school, 30 kids around there, and um, eight grades. So in the first grade, there'll be maybe eight kids, 10 kids. Right, right. In the eighth grade, there'll only be two right. or three. Right, so it was, it was your whole grade, basically. The whole yeah, grade, I yeah, see. yeah. So, so we, we, uh, we discovered this stuff. As a matter of fact... Uh, I went to a jamboree in Prince Edward Island, which is mm -hmm. way across Canada. And I'm um, walking along, and there is a scout troop, and they said, Spruce Home Scout Troop. And I, I went up, and I said, are you talking about Spruce Home north of Prince Albert? Well, <laughs> that school started up another scout troop right. <laughs> after long years after I had uh -huh. left. And, and so on. So it was kind of interesting. And so I stopped and I said, well, you know, that's where I was brought up. And mm -hmm. I said, that's how uh, I learned my scouting mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense of uh, uh, learn, the three of us learning. Yeah, the schoolyard was completely surrounded by pasture. Right. And all the teacher probably knew that we would go under the wire and light a fire and right. brew tea and uh -huh. do it. We did all kinds of stuff. That, with the minimum amount of knowledge, uh, whatever we learned out of the scout literature, it, it kept us yeah. going and interested. So you've in always it. been quite self-motivated in learning those things and going out and practicing them, and that that seems to be something yeah. that started early on. So. Yeah, well, uh, in elementary school, grade six, I think it was, is when uh, grade six or seven we got a vehicle finally uh, that we could go to town. 10 miles, mm -hmm. so it was a grain truck, three-ton grain truck, and uh, shortly, in a few years, we ended up getting a, a car, uh, and we, so my, my parents, uh, you know, uh, on the way to prosperity and successful farming, mm -hmm. when we started to drive to town, uh, it became feasible that the library card, the school system would provide any student that could use a library card to the to the uh, Prince Albert Library, public library, mm -hmm. they give us a card. So very shortly, I began to borrow books. Mm. And there's one book I ran across when I looked at it and flipped through it and so on. I developed, uh, what do you call it? I'm a, I had to have that book. Mm. <laughs> so I, I, I understood you can buy books. You mm. can buy books in a library. So I take this book to the counter and I say to the person, uh, uh, I said, how does one go about buying a book like this? 
And she said, oh, no big deal. She said, uh, uh, let's price it. Uh, you bring the money, we'll send for it. So the very first book was the Ashley Book of Knots. Ah, <laughs> and yes. I was, I, 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 you know, like I often would say, I would love to have collected stamps, but I couldn't afford to. <laughs> but I could afford to collect like knots, knots. Yeah. And, uh, and so on. So, <laughs> so I became very intrigued. I mean, the Ashley Book of Knots is like, you know, th- close to three thousand uh, mm. knots. Um, most of them decorative and so on. But uh, uh, in our knots tying. And the scouting and whatever, uh, in a very functional level of knots. Uh, they, um, well, of course, I could tell a story, but uh, for example, as a surveyor, I worked for a road construction crew, and one of the 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 person who drove a big earth moving machine, who I would have fired for a variety of reasons, mm-hmm. but I I didn't own the company. So yeah, this, this it's drizzling, and this big earth moving machine with full load of dirt is going south. I'm going north, and as I'm walking, the machine is sort of going at full bore, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden it goes up, and I like <laughs> it's like how can that happen? Mm-hmm. Well, when I turn, he's driven off the road, and the machine is totally upside down, and the muffler stuck in the mud. Oh, and the, the engine stopped oh, dead, yeah. and I could see that he's uh, he's not going to drown, but he's struggling trying to get out for, uh, from under this. And so now here we have a uh, earth moving machine full of full of dirt upside down in the ditch, uh, and much to my surprise, um, they got a, 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 a caterpillar tractor that was about the size of a locomotive. Mm-hmm. It was the lar- largest caterpillar in its line right. must have been locally available they move there and they're going to pull this thing out of the uh, upright in the ditch and they take this cable which is probably an inch and a half or two inches in diameter and when they go to hitch it up one end has a, a loop with three you know with uh, uh, clamps the other end is no loop right and uh, the closest place where you could buy clamps for that size of cable is a three-hour drive <laughs> <laughs> from the city that might have a hardware store that carries it. And the, and this big engine is purring away, ready yes. to do its work. So I imagine the, the people that hired it, they're, they're, they're going to say, yeah, you've got to pay for the fact yeah. that... Uh, and I, and I said, no, no sweat. I'll put a tie, a, a bowl in, in that cable. Uh, I had the confidence to think that I knew how to tie a bow and wire cable that mm. thick. And I knew how. And it worked. And I made a, a big loop. Mm-hmm. And when they, people saw the bowling, like they marveled, how the hell can you tie a bowling like that? Well, you got to have, you know, what, something to anchor to and another cat, and there you mm-hmm. set it up. And as you draw, it, it's a slipknot affair. And there's a slipknot that you can achieve in the cable. Uh, and, and as you draw the slip knot tighter and tighter, it switches into a bowl okay. and, and so on. So my years of uh, uh, insight in, in knots and working with stuff like that came to the fore, and mm. I was a master scout, but yes. I, <laughs> I could save the company a yes. lot of money because we could, we could tie a, a loop in the end yeah. of that game. And not well, waste a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Good, stuff. Good stuff. One of the things that, as I say, we're doing at this symposium is honoring people who went before us and um what what do you credit tom with in terms of the main things that you learned from him well when i met tom i would say that the relationship that i had to tom is i uh, like some of you know our co-instructors like kelly harlton and so on if Kelly uh, kelly can learn everything I know, and he starts from that point mm. too. Uh, so with Tom, he in our relationship, he had worked out like the the ski shoe and the pack frame and the signal fire and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so in a short while, he passes that knowledge to me, mm-hmm. and I have the opportunity, just like Kelly, to actually augment or improve or or do this, and that's sort of the mechanism. Mm-hmm. Tom went so far with the snow, ski shoe, and I said, well, um, uh, you know, like the idea is you buy a pair of skis, ski shoes, or snowshoes, 
and you have to deal with the uh, with the article that you can't vary or change because it's already built. But if you have to build it in the field, build it according to the conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you are on a snowmobile, you build a, 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 a ski shoe that maybe the sticks are, are um, you know, meter and use three because that'll support you on the snowmobile trail. trail yeah. But if you try to walk out, you keep breaking through, which mm -hmm. is exhausting. So, so you might even carry six sticks like that, and you get into a situation, rather than wallowing in the snow and trying to make everything from scratch, you've got this bundle that'll stow on the snowmobile, um, and uh, uh, I could build a full-fledged ski shoe um, at this if the forest is there and I can cut out the, the slender tree and peel it. So I peel five sticks and, and uh, everything, and I have a functional snowshoe within half an hour. Mm -hmm. So in an hour, but even that's, you know, why are you building a, a, a snowshoe that's got five sticks and taller than you are? That, that, there's all kinds of parameters, but whereas if you shorten it and stay on the snowmobile trail, that's all you need. So, yes. you know, then they, and, you know they, and then there's exceptionally uh, powdery snow where you build a bigger s a snowshoe. And then there is the issue of traveling on ice where it might still be dangerous where you could break through. Well, you make a two-stick snowshoe that's 12 feet long. Mm. You use poles that you might have, you can 12 feet, then you've got four sticks, and you walk safely on a centimeter of ice, mm -hmm. and you're not going to break through. It's distributing it across. Mm. Yeah. And actually, in the summertime, when you are traveling long distance, the muskigs are kind of... Uh, uh, exhausting to mm. walk through. Build your pelt, simple ski shoe that'll hold you up on the muskeg, mm -hmm. and you you might not you might might not even get your feet wet because you're you're not sinking in mm. the moss. Mm. So mm. Uh, so it's it's, use, it's applying it in into different contexts and yeah, you there. look around yeah. and what are the conditions of all the choices you have? You you have a concept. I, I work with native people. And the challenge is that native people see me as a young looking guy and there's a, and they're old veteran trappers and mm. who's he going to teach me survival? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I ran across a situation where, where I was hired, I was going to spend uh, 40 days in this college of which I had a week with these native trapper instructors and the reason I was there was the college uh, uh, figured they should get some survival because... I think it was 16 graduates from that college froze to death that year. Wow. That's why I was there. Wow. But the instructors, the people, the senior people that take uh, the apprentices, they didn't seem to appreciate that. I mm. knew I was there because such a number of mm. people, and they, it was obvious they needed to teach survival mm -hmm. to, uh, to the, the, the people they worked with. And, uh, and, and, and it, it was evident that they weren't. So you don't say to a young person, you know, do you know how to survive? They'll say yes. Do you know how to light a fire? They'll say yes, mm -hmm. and, and and that sort of thing because that you don't do that. You, you say to the student, you know, the way we do things in the bush. You might know how to get by, but I'm going to show you my technique. Yes. So the person doesn't have to say yes. Well, it took when I started uh, from the time we started class at nine until I stopped and paused to uh, ask for questions. Well, I saw people furiously writing. They were writing down every point they were going to mm -hmm. contest me and so on. I, I realized that when they started asking the question, they were sort of saying, we're going to put you in your place. Yes. You're, 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 we're competent, skilled. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, uh, I'd never uh, sort of had that situation. So, so I'm thinking, oh. Uh, and the first thing I said, I said, you know, I'm a survival instructor. You're a trapper. Mm -hmm. I'm not a trapper. You're not a survival instructor. Yes. But that didn't really work. Mm. Because uh, then the strategy, because I said, How, what am I going to do with this? Oh, I, from now on, I am going to say, do you want me to show you? Yes. And I work with Native people a lot. They have a hard time putting a razor's edge on a knife. Mm. <clears throat> and they're trappers, so the elusive nature of beaver fat you should know how to sharpen a knife. And I said, <coughs> would you want me to show you how I would sharpen a knife until you could shave with? 
you know, would it help you with skinning a beaver? Well, they had to agree. Yeah. And the way I couched the term, if you didn't say it right, I would say, hey, okay, you're so smart, you run the class. Yes. I'll listen to what you've got to say. <laughs> so so I, I, I actually started with that. And then uh, looking out the window as I'm, you know, teaching them, how, you know, demonstrating how I can sharpen my knife till I can shave with, I'm looking out and I said that density of forest is just about probably very good to make ski shoes. Hmm. So, so I said, what if we, you know, you, you lose a, ski, a snowshoe, you break a snowshoe, the dogs eat the webbing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would it be useful to know to replace the, a, mi a missing snowshoe? Well, they figured that, that would be good. Well, they didn't notice that I purposely put more flotation on my snowshoe because I put one of their snowshoes on one foot and I went along and I, I, so so I hear, oh look 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 how his snowshoe isn't sinking like the yeah. regular snowshoe we're used to. <laughs> and so I got there, you know, I'm saying I'm not here to talk down to you. I'm mm. not here to teach you something already. No, I'm here to to give you the the insights on how you uh uh, relate to a person from your community uh, and, and, and the assumptions that you might make because after all such a large number of graduates from this college that were under your tuition froze to death mm. and they, they of course they didn't I, I, I sort of was able to sort of get back at them mm -hmm. and after a while they realized that Polish fair-skinned non-Indian uh, had something and we really to, got on uh, because yeah, I, yeah. I had them like for for you know another six days right. and, and so on so but anyway then I had fisheries officers mm -hmm. and they're all native and they go to the college and they keep taking the course over until they finally pass and so all the fisheries officers have vehicles and we go out and it's uh, snow has been plowed, but there's room for us to park on the edge. And so here's 20 fisheries officers' vehicles, and there's one guy wearing a beaded jacket, and all the rest are in uniform. Uh -huh. And the people that day would go ice facing. They'd drive by all these vehicles, turn around, and go home. Because <laughs> <laughs> there didn't, the fishery yeah, officers in there. Want, yeah. they, didn't want, they, they expected we're going to have a lot of trouble because there's an awful lot of them, and they might be running some kind of a class, or we're going to be the guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I noticed the, the people that drove uh, onto the lake uh, didn't stay, didn't fish that day. They, they just went. So, anyway, uh, so it funny. was a lot of fun. Funny, funny. Um, what in in terms of your contributions, you, you're associated with things like uh, the super shelter, the flip flop winch some of those things which you know there are very few people in this field who seem to have created new things we, we often take like you say you, you learn from your mentors you use it as a starting point mm -hmm. you you add maybe your own spice to it but it's essentially what a lot of us are doing is passing on information that we've learned and is well tested but you're known to have yeah. invented some new things can you tell us about the the origins of the well, super shelter well as I, uh, you find that most people uh, assume you must know how to build an igloo. Mm. Tom Roycroft said the RCAF establishment figured that a white man didn't have the capability to build an igloo until somebody, a white man, built one, and then they realized you don't have to be an Eskimo. Mm -hmm. But they thought that was so complex that the only way you could build an igloo if you uh, grown up in that situation. Mm -hmm. So, so they uh, at first they sort of are saying, well, a white man can't build an igloo. Well, ridiculous uh, uh, sort of thing. But anyway, so I realized that people, uh, you realize that people uh, expect that as an instructor, I must know how to build an igloo. Mm -hmm. So I have to master how to build an igloo and build igloos. And as I'm building igloos, uh, I get the insight that the snow is kind of a contrary contradiction that you're using the snow that melts at zero to create a bubble, capture a bubble of warm air. So you got a warm, semi-tropical environment and everything is built, right? The occupant is stripped to the waist mm. most of the time. If the kudlik is going, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you know, the colder it is, the better things work because if it's too warm, 
you can compromise the strength the strength of the dome. Mm-hmm. So you might have to uh, drain some of the heat that accumulates because uh, if you're cooking um, and the heat and the temperature can reach body temperature at the very top of the dome. The temperature at the floor is outside temperature, but uh, you know. So the and, and the bench is placed very specifically. Uh, you know, it's like minus four. It's not as minus forty or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's got to be cooled so that it reduces the melting, and then you cover that, uh, preferably with polar bear uh, hides, uh, to insulate yourself from the snow. And, uh, and and for the igloo to work properly, and especially if you're using a kudlik, you can't close the door because you'll suffer from, you have to have a, a certain amount of circulation. Mm. So the door faces probably the lee and um, and the, the even when the snow, uh, um, when you make the uh, igloo, you depend on a certain amount of porosity in the snow and you must set the igloo where wind will help refresh mm. especially if you're using a kudlik because you're cooking and and so on so there's all kinds of complex complex things you know you see a picture and i look at it well right away the author doesn't seem to appreciate that they have too much overhead room mm. there you, you got to sort of uh, you don't go and uh, you got this dome up there and you're down mm. where 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 it's, it's uh, cold much in the colder yeah. and, and but anyway so it occurred to me, I said that the snow is the building material, but what if I could uh, imitate uh, or, or achieve the same results using, without well, using snow? Well, mylar, mm-hmm. when it occurred to me, mylar was available, which is very shiny. The igloo depends on the highly reflective surface with the multitudinous little facets of mirrors of snow. And um, and if you make a bench where where uh, you know you find that a chair seat bench is more than almost adequate, but the cold air is near the ground and and you're a much much warmer, uh, uh, and, you know just chair seat high above the ground, and on and on and again low overhead volume. And so, actually, uh, you use a window to let the warming effect of a fire outside. So now the window demands that you use the knowledge you use to make a greenhouse. Mm. Because you can set up a super shelter with the snow being ref- uh, reflecting and the sun shining directly. And, and you might be able to get most of your sleep between 11 o'clock in the morning and, and 3 o'clock where the, mm. the, the, uh, you don't need to have a fire going. The, 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 the survivalist... Uh, he wants to keep to a normal schedule where the worst time to stay warm is between midnight and the crack of dawn. Yeah. And maybe you're going to be active having to deal with that cold rather than... And, and to get your rapid eye movement undisturbed sleep, you might lay down at, uh, and you're tired enough to fall asleep for four hours and you might function on a good sound sleep and any other amount of sleeping and dozing is a bonus mm. sort of in the strategy. So anyway, when I it occurred to me, how come in all the world there's no one else that says, "Oh, what if I try to achieve the same results with mylar, polyethylene, and parachute uh, uh, without using snow?" Well, mm-hmm. it's a super shelter. Mm-hmm. It's science, mm-hmm. and it works, mm-hmm. and so on. So, so when you build a lean-to in the open front, it's a certain way you keep warm in there, and there, you know, essentially. The value of teaching survival skills and so on to kids is that the architect has to use all kinds of things to build, to build a, a, you know, a residence. And if you defy any of those, like absorption, emission, reflectivity, um, the thermal mass, on and on, then a house won't work mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lead won't work. True. And the kid is learning about those things as part of their education. Mm-hmm. So you know all these uh, factors that enter in, in into uh, achieving a comfortable home you might say so so the people that don't indulge in that sort of thing um, are remiss in that the the kids uh, need to be mm. you, you you use that approach killing two birds with one stone mm-hmm. architecture and so on uh, in general terms and the specific 
what you got to focus in, uh, what you can achieve. You know, the inverse cube law. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying hard for years and years. I'm trying to describe how you describe uh, how big a fire you should use. Well, eventually you realize a fire is described by how much it forces you away. Hmm. So if you build a fire that forces you a step away, that's, you know, you don't say fire made out of sticks on knee high, and whatever. No, you keep adding fuel until you've got to stay beyond the range. Well, as a matter of fact, if you build a fire in survival, build it when there's about a foot of snow, build the fire, and, and keep building that fire until the fire melts the snow to the extent that you can put your bed within that boundary. Right. And that, that's a very graphical way mm. that you can exactly know how big your fire is going to be and, and, and so on. So when the radiance from the fire stops melting, well, what if you put your bed against that mm-hmm. and then whatever's left, that's a good way to teach yourself mm. how big your fire is going to be. And it's not a small fire. No. You can't have something for nothing. And, and, and that a lot of people, are, they build a little fire and they build a circle of stones and they got fire that's meant to be in a, in a wood stove at 40 below. Mm-hmm. That's, that's actually, uh, and, and uh, you know, so turn to the fire section. Oh, yet another survival manual. And I, uh, the moment I see that circle of stones, uh, and, and then on top of that, if you're using sticks, obviously they seem to be cut. Cut short. Where is your saw yeah. what tool did you use yeah, yeah. you 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 didn't mention a lot of those uh, people they forget that you got to uh, mention the tool that they harvested mm-hmm. and right away it's a giveaway that I'm wasting my money and my time buying that book because <laughs> it's it's not tried and tested by people who know the other thing that we've talked about briefly before Moors um, but we're on the subject of fire um, fire reflectors What's your thoughts on this? And, the, and it seems to be a particular fad. You see it a lot on YouTube videos. As soon as somebody has a little fire, and then they've got a stack of wood, you know, pinned between, you know, a couple of uprights on the far yeah. side, and it's not even necessarily that cold. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on well, why people are doing that? Well, and, and what are the mis- are there any misconceptions there, and yeah, what's well, going on there? Well, in the physics, only mirrors reflect. A mirror, hmm. a shiny surface. The surface of water at a certain angle, the surface of snow. So you get in the higher altitudes, you get reflection, which very often you get up a sunburn up your nostrils because there's a reflecting out there. So to call a reflector, uh, you know, the phenomenon of reflecting, uh, that's, you know, a mylar blanket. Mm-hmm. It's got to be something very shiny. Mm-hmm. And even there are blankets that are not shiny and they are almost useless because the aluminum appearance of the surface is a very poor so reflection says turn the direction of a glowing body back to you mm. and and um, uh, and you know, also uh, when you got a, a reflector uh, it's it's uh, it's the inverse square law mm-hmm. uh, well the, it's actually the inverse cube law because it was pointed out to me that the inverse square law works for a, um, a vacuum, <laughs> and, uh-huh. and the air that surrounds you interferes with things. So it's a closer rule so to call it the inverse. So cube you're law. warming air, and it's evap- it, it's convecting away, or it's just yeah. it's just absorbing so, some of the so heat. The, yeah. the uh, heating engineer that took this—he's actually a good friend of Randy's, uh, and and uh, it was my good fortune that he took some courses. Mm. And he was involved in installing furnaces and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm looking to the literature uh, to try to describe fire so that, you, you know, for every centimeter, the, the, the back of the shelter is further than you need to be. You lose a tremendous amount of, of opportunity to heat. And if you don't build your fire right against the wall, whether it's made out of stone or logs, that's where you get the greatest effect. When you show a log wall uh, a foot away to keep it like furniture so it's not consumed, that is a total waste of time because the fire has to hit that surface, warm up, and then re-radiate mm. all that way, and so on. So people who don't, uh, 
realized that they should uh, go back to their physics that they took in high school because what they're saying is just is not <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of say, I always sort of said if possible have science direct you mm -hmm. and and that was worked very well and that's where the super shelter does so well uh, because you, uh, you you're playing around with uh, the science of of uh, you know the warming rays and the, you know it just happens for example that uh, polyethylene is way more translucent to radiant whereas glass is very opaque mm. so if you had a big fire outside of a greenhouse you'd discover the glass would really prevent you from warming up the mm. interior of that greenhouse and the, and the glass itself gets quite hot well, well, it could yeah, get quite yeah, hot, but, but it's it's absorbing well, some of that heat. Well, yeah. if you have a wood stove that has a glass door, yeah, and get a good fire going and close the door and get it going till it's woofing, and then put your hand and you're almost touching the glass, yeah. and you can tolerate it. Yeah. Open the door, and now you discover that yeah. you gotta probably you you're gonna have to stay a foot further mm. than you would have because the glass was uh, was. Uh, uh, screening it, mm. but but yeah, the um, yeah, now I I get to talking and the vibration of my brain. So I we start were, missing. So the, I, the, I mean, we were it was all relevant. Oh, oh, that right, but we were but we were talking about reflect. the so-called fire reflector. Yeah, well, there was um, uh, you know like in reality, it seems like I encounter in my line of work, I encounter unusual people that are more knowledgeable because I would say if I went back to university and took uh, uh, physics and other things, um, uh, so you mean, there's this guy, his name is Wally, Dr. Wally Cottle, a medical degree, comes from a long line of gunsmiths in Edmonton, mm -hmm. and he pointed out, you say, in reality, there is no reflection. When you build a wall, it's absorption and re-emission, mm. and that mechanism is so different that if you're thinking reflection, you're so far out that you are your own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. You're you you just not you're not doing it right. But if the idea is to warm the log, so the radiance that warms the log is absorbed by the log, and then the log gives off a weaker, mm -hmm. uh, longer wavelength. So you, you you know you might be able to utilize that in some way, but appreciate. There's a big difference between a surface that is acting like a mirror, which redirects uh, almost uh, mm. you know, everything, whatever hits it, whereas the log doesn't. So, so you're you're displaying your ignorance by by. Uh, so I'm trying to change the name. Mm. I said re-emitter fire, mm. <laughs> and I've had a lot of trouble with that because I would say, oh, let's build a re-emitter fire, and the people would come along and say, what are you talking about, re-emitter fire? Mm. And I said, well, oh, you mean the reflector? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they want, don't want to change. Right. I'm trying to, so the people that are coming up, that are not going to question that, but the old timers, oh, that's yeah, what yeah. you're at. And of course, they, they, they might not be that impressed or keen in that subtlety. So, so I would say wall backfire, and then wall. I got around it. Okay. So build a wall. The wall could be dirt or a bank or mm -hmm. logs, green logs. And of course, uh, if, if if it's bitter cold, that um, wall back might be dry wood because you almost need at 60 below you almost need the the wall to to work effectively. Mm. So you're trying to achieve a, a sort of like a, like the uh, uh, infrared heaters that are trying to keep the ice from jamming the the automatic doors that they're shining down. Mm -hmm. You're trying to create a surface that glows like that. Mm -hmm. So if you work at it, you can actually do a fairly good job, which means that the biggest logs that you can find and in, in extreme cold, they're dry logs. And as the fire burns against the surface, it, it acts almost like a catalytic heater. Yeah. And the wall has to be high enough that as the fire burns, it, the wall causes a draw. And instead of the smoke going in your face, mm. it goes over your head. And, and so, so, you, so it's literally right next to the fire. Yeah, yeah. again, that yeah. fire right. Mm -hmm. Anytime I see a person write a survival manual and they have a space between the logs and the fire, 
slam the book mm-hmm. shut and don't buy it because you're not going to get much benefit for someone who actually uh, hasn't gone through the the agony that I have to try to <laughs> the, the the two things that are really poorly done even yet you know uh, is uh, fire in the boreal forest long term fire su- sustaining fire so if you can build a fire that you light it and uh, and then adjust it well most fires you're probably adjusting every hour mm. so that means if you're trying to deal you're going to have to get up and do something yep. about it because it'll be too cold for you to sleep yep. so you the, the fire that burns a long long time that's a unusual fire mm. well in finland they will take two logs if they can get them that big and they set them up uh, so that the fire is in between mm. and that fire is not as robust as the big fire you you put it maybe this far away from the front of the uh, the uh, and and since you've got a window which no matter it doesn't have to in the open lean to the fire has to be as about as long as you're tall mm-hmm. but in front of a super shelter you can uh, reduce it to half the length as, and thereby get twice as much benefit mm-hmm. uh, for the amount of fuel you got left and it, and since you're using a super shelter maybe use a quarter of the fuel to warm the super shelter than you would ever have mm. to warm a lean to because it's more the efficient. radiance sort of uh, it's not trapped unless you've got a means to to trap the uh, warm air and keep it in place a hole the size of your finger in the top of a super shelter the heat jets out of there like smoke out of a chimney <laughs> and 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 when you uh, when you build a, a snow a quincy a lot of people they put a hole in the roof and I'm pretty sure that you are losing a great deal of the benefit that you should be. You're, they don't know that you can put the hole. For, if you want fresh air, that hole can be below my chest, mm-hmm. my, my, my bed. Yes. And, and it works for me. Mm-hmm. But anybody that puts it in the roof for some reason, well, other people do it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they, they display their lack of maturity of not questioning the issue of, mm-hmm. of how you, you, uh, you know, like an igloo. Uh, they usually show a chimney. And what it means is the Eskimo uh, finds that if it's too uh, warm, uh, you begin to compromise. And if it's too warm uh, inside the shelter and too warm outside, you, you're going to melt a hole in your roof. Right. And, and so you drain. The, uh, so you have to have a box or insulated thing and, uh, and, a smo- and the, uh, warm air. And if you don't have that liner, the hole gets bigger and bigger. Right. So you so you got to have a liner, or else you'll compromise the whole. You know that that mm-hmm. sort of a thing. Yeah. Do you do you think it's? Im- I mean, you've talked about sort of questioning things. Do you think it's important for us all when, you know, rather than just receiving wisdom, to really question it? Well, there are times when you don't understand something. Mm. I would say, in my own case. I don't understand what's supposed to go on. What is the mechanism? I always, always found that uh, science, <coughs> you know, <laughs> being, um, you know, physiology and and uh, and physics and science, they all play a role. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so things have to stay within a, uh, a rational, reasonable parameter. Mm-hmm. And when you exceed out of that, you, then you sort of say, okay, this is uh, better find out what the issue is yes. sort of thing. You know, there's a lot of things that superficially you, uh, uh, you know, you want, it's like one thing uh, and then you discover when you examine it and you deal with it, you find very often the opposite works far better mm. than, than what was, uh, you know, there's all kinds of old things. You know, like for example, boil your water to uh, uh, purify it, and then after you boil it, you pour it back and forth from one pot to the other to get back the taste. But if you boil water and drink it hot, sort of scalding your mouth, your tissues uh, you derive 10% more survival time if you're drinking hot water. And, the, and they thought, well, the heat from the water is saving you on energy. Mm. No. It's disassociating the oxygen from the water, and the tissues can absorb that water far more effectively mm. than uh, 
than, than oxygenated water. Mm. So what do people do? They keep telling you that, uh, you know, and then people, they tell you that don't eat snow, you'll chill yourself. Well, uh, how come the Eskimos in, in long periods of time, sometimes that's the only way they could make up their water. How come they can get away with it? Yes. Why, are, why, why is this person saying? And then when you analyze the amount of calories that is devoted to melting the water from, from uh, a zero um, to body, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, the cost is probably a slice of white bread to meet your water needs. So what are you telling me? Uh, don't eat snow. If you can, <laughs> so there was a, a med student who got caught in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. and I think he survived like 48 days by eating balls of snow because he knew if you put snow on your lips, you get chapped and it's mm -hmm. painful. Get it in your mouth and melt it, yes. and he got by. Mm -hmm. So that was a proof that anybody that I hear saying don't eat snow, I don't know where they got it from. Tom and I questioned it. Mm -hmm. At first, we accepted it, and then after a while, well, how come this? You know, how come the Eskimos would? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the Eskimos would uh, go to great contortions to uh, to be able to, you know, meet their water needs when mm -hmm. when they don't have much heat to be able to melt the snow or the ice. It was, uh, you know, it's uh, it's definitely, but it's not definitely uh, a bit of a problem but uh, but you got to realize you have to have the water yeah and, and and so on so so when you say try not to consume too much snow you better know what you're talking about because what the error is the people are not thinking in terms of the calorie as opposed to the kilocalorie mm -hmm. the amount of heat to heat <laughs> one a liter one kilogram of water one degree mm. they're talking about uh, you know the amount of heat to melt one gram of water yes. one degree and there's a, a factor uh, of a difference yes. of three decimal points yes. be careful that you you understand that you're not perpetuating something because your math is poor yes. you know, so. yeah. no, that makes sense that makes sense um I've had quite a few conversations with people here and a few have said some of their biggest learnings are from big mistakes they've made. <laughs> are there any that spring to mind for you where things have not gone to plan, either experimenting with techniques or just when you've been out where you've really learned something from it, either in approach or in technique? Well... There's such a thing you don't want to publicly admit. <laughs> People will say, <laughs> "Well, I have been fortunate that I haven't." Uh, you know, people say, "Have you ever experienced a survival episode?" Mm. And I haven't. Well, you know, like I always tell people, be like the man who broke his arm in three places. Two, two places. <laughs> He should have stayed out of those two places. <laughs> that is, uh, being brought up on a farm, yeah. you are exposed to horses. So mm -hmm. likely is that by the time you have spent time with the horses, you know how not to get kicked by mm -hmm. a horse. Mm -hmm. And if you're using an axe and you sort of realize the close misses, after a while, the axe uh, isn't. But we could train you right off the bat to be how to avert the dangers because we'll tell you what the dangers mm -hmm. are well like i say i mentioned that there's a common axe cut that's chopping yourself in the forehead mm -hmm. you take a you know the boy's axe that fits in there in mm -hmm. your in your um, hand and the head at that length and if you're you know when you watch movies that the director has no idea what axe in, about you see a person chopping a tree down at belly button height. Mm. Well, if you chop upward, which they seem like they think that that's the way to do, you can glance the axe right into your face so easy. And if you stay near the ground and you don't chop upward because you've taught that you can progress through the tree faster going like this mm -hmm. and then going like this, uh, then, you know, 
just because you go through a log faster when it's laying down and you think that you can extrapolate and cut upward, upwards yeah. and it's you know Tom said it's such a common thing uh, that people would chop upward uh, and then of course they included the the issue uh, that uh, you know you got to chop downward and you got to stay close to the ground mm-hmm. you can chop downward and if your belly button high a glancing thing is going to end up somewhere between your kneecap and your toes yes. and on and on so there's a there's probably three or four safety procedures that prevents you from not coming even close to glancing an axe uh, to any part of your body mm-hmm. You know that that sort of a thing. Um, you know, but the, you know, I came I, when I met Tom. I, I had been a surveyor for many years, and I did my share of felling. You know, the the issue you discover is the worst student and the best student is a fellow instructor, a fellow instructor who is saying, "Okay, I'm going to stay, watch you do it." to see how I can improve me, or the fellow instructor that's intimidated doesn't want to be there. Mm. That, 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 you know, that, that, that's a phenomenon I've encountered mm. a lot. Uh, because uh, uh, one, maybe humility is something, but I think I encountered that more in military instructors who didn't come up with a way where, where you gotta sort of uh, display good manners and don't leave when all of a sudden, the people are doing stuff that mm-hmm. might compromise your knowledge, rather than saying, "I'll stay and watch," you know, pick up pointers. Yes. So when I first saw Tom using an axe, uh, I was like, had been using axes, and I thought I I was just stunned to see what it took, how simple it was to stay safe. Now, I didn't know any mm-hmm. of those principles. That sort of, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I understood what he's saying. Oh, oh, this, that, you don't do that. So if Tom said, don't cup outward, and mm-hmm. this is why, the next, uh, I've got that. I, I, it's it's going to be in my talk when I finally get to give my own Axe article uh-huh. and on and on. But I wrote a, uh, we, well, I wrote a, Tom and I wrote the chapter on uh, the use of the Axe which uh, probably was like 95% Tom's input and 5% of mine. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, well, many times the compensation people would ask, can we photocopy your, your axe article because we're giving a safety talk on the use of axes mm-hmm. sort of thing. But uh, yeah, the, uh, well, safety. Uh, I have had the good fortune that, that uh, uh, well, I, there are times, but I got to always mm. stop and think because there are issues where you, you do, you know, inattentiveness or yeah. something comes up, and uh, and you you, yeah. <laughs> you you reflect on you're that. Yeah. you're uh, like rather uncomfortable, yes. and if anybody hears that I put myself in this position, my credibility yeah, is yeah. going yeah. is going to be shot. Uh, but it's not very. Co- Common, you know, like more, more maybe. Yeah. Uh, I I I had accidents where I wasn't thinking, mm. and those accidents <laughs> created a severe situation. Mm. Uh, I was working in a construction camp for the Department of Natural Resources, in Saskatchewan, and uh, we set up a new camp to start a hole. Uh, a new road, probably about 100 mm-hmm. miles we'd be building. Mm-hmm. And so we we're starting. We just established the camp, and we went to get uh, water tra- uh, water with a wa- water trailer. Mm-hmm. Maybe it should be against the law to make water trailers with two wheels <laughs> instead of four. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I read these signs all the time. Don't ride in the bucket of an earth moving machine. Mm-hmm. But everybody loads up on the bucket of the earth moving machine and go two miles down the road, and we create a, uh, a you know pail by pail. What do you call it? A, mm-hmm. a, like a human chain. Sort yeah, of yeah. Well, so you're you're uh, passing pails mm-hmm. and you're pouring it. So this thing is made out of wood, and it's got sides all made out of watertight joints of wood. They're flat on top, and there's two um, openings. Uh, and the uh, wood lids with a handle 
And so you're pouring the water into the trailer in 200 gallons. And it never occurred to me, what if this unhitches? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to the trailer? And it unhitched, and I was sitting on that trailer. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so we drove there. There was no problem. And we filled it up. I got back on there, and I'm holding on to the, one of the lids with the, with the handle. And as the machine, as the driver, whose mother was the cook, decelerates, the trailer unhitches, the trailer drops on the ground and jams in the ground. I fly off. I'm holding on the lid, mm. and I wish I hadn't, but then I don't know the consequence. I could have been killed just from, mm. well, probably the fact that I was a gymnast or something. I flew over, and I landed. I had gravel burns. I, I grabbed my hat, so this side was all uh, mm. gravel embedded and everything, gravel embedded here. And I hit the ground in a way where I rolled, but the lid in the other hand, which was square, hits me next to my spine. Mm -hmm. And that's what the doctors say. I was in such pain because they, they, uh, they, 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 they didn't realize what damage might be, so mm -hmm. they held me in the hospital. Well, anyway, I fly off. The gush of water comes out of that where the lid was, absolutely hits me and and i'm now laying in a pool of water gravel and dirt mm. and i'm laying there and i had no recollection of this when i came back from hospital um, you know i sort of curious because i didn't remember <laughs> what happened was um, <clears throat> i didn't remember i flew off mm -hmm. uh, i was probably knocked out initially because it flew quite a ways it probably knocked yeah, the wind out of me and then yeah. Uh, and then, uh, then I uh, then they said they were afraid to move me. My back might be broken. Well, I had enough medical knowledge <laughs> that I said, "Oh, you think uh, you know? If I can lift my feet like this, mm -hmm. uh, my back is not broken." And I demonstrated that I can lift my feet. Well, then uh, they were saying, "Well, what are we going to do?" And I I was the one that said, "Get two mattresses, roll me." on the one, put another mattress to consolidate me so that, you know, carefully around, lift it. Yeah, yeah. And then and it's 50 miles to the local hospital. And the, and the local hospital has a strike. Hmm. So instead of five doctors, there's only one doctor. Oh, oh, and the nurses are like suffering from all this and they're not changing my bandages. I can smell that they're starting to get problematic. Mm. I figure there's gravel ingrained in my, so I, uh, I start digging out pebbles out of my forehead. I start changing, I, sh I rip off the bandages, and then, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Well, I, I just smiled. What the heck, they, what are they gonna do? They're gonna have to put fresh bandages yep, on now, right. and, and so on. But, but the uh, doctor figured that I better stay uh, to get to the bottom of what damage might have caused. Mm. Well, it hit me, uh, didn't crack a rib, but it really, the corner really created mm. a bruise that was very painful, mm -hmm. so that I could uh, hardly walk and, and on and on. So until that abated a bit, uh, then I went back to the camp. Mm -hmm. And when I, uh, uh, you know, when I went back, I, you know, I said, I don't, I, I was, between these two mattresses, it was like I had just eaten a meal, and very often we have an opportunity to lay down for a short while, mm -hmm. and the sensation was that I was going somewhere and everybody obstructed me. I put my head down and I was pushing through the crowd. Hmm. That's what the recollection was. It wasn't a recollection that, uh, you know, I woke up between two mattresses mm. just covered with mud and so on and there's guys sitting there looking you know down and I mm. wake up and and uh, and, and you know, so, so now I, you know I realize well you flew off the water rack and oh <laughs> okay so when I got back to camp I I, I, I sort of uh, well that's yeah. you know that's uh, that's about the worst thing happened to me yeah. which probably helped me to be more cautious, cautious and yeah. think a little further ahead yeah. and say hmm why didn't I realize that that was a two wheel trailer yeah. and why no, didn't I realize it's all good life experiences well, well the, apparently I didn't remember that 
But the, the commotion that happened is he decelerated, mm. and the cook liked me. She was, and she went into hysterics that her son had killed me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Apparently, she she really well, she really took it hard. And, all's well, well that ends was, well, as they say. Now I can hear people starting to file in for dinner next door more, so we'll 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 finish up shortly. But we've been here at the GBS for three or four days now. What have been your highlights of this event? What what have what do you think's been well, good about it? Uh, there. Uh, it's the great number of people like Lars and Tom Luchens and Dave Holder and Brenda and you know, mm. I can probably name a quarter of the people are uh, familiar faces from other situations mm -hmm. and you know to visit with Lars he's coming to my place for a day or two mm -hmm. to visit with Lars is particularly um, you know I uh, I, I couldn't remember if the arrangement and Lars saying, well, what museum can I go to? I said, well, I talked to him to come to my place mm. and stay overnight and, and having his helper learn more about my yes. my, my contribution. But generally, I would say um, there there's so many people that over the time, uh, Dave West got an holiday, on and on, um, the people that have come back uh, uh, from you know people that took courses, mm -hmm. my knife maker mm -hmm. Rod Garcia, and and on and on. Uh, that was the highest point of of um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, it's neat to be able to meet people. Yes. At, I'm almost 80. Mm -hmm. I'm likely getting close to the point. Well, probably not in <laughs> and not participate in anything like this anymore. Because unless they run another course uh, or two here, mm. here if it's out of province, forget it. Yeah, I, it's I'm, too far. Yeah. I'm, I'm too. Uh, mm. I'm. I'm too decrepit to, to go in. Don, uh, Don the Doer, mm. my friend from Four Dog Stove in in uh, Minnesota, uh, he, he in particularly enjoys coming and visiting with me. Mm -hmm. And so when I ended up uh, having to. They sprung me, sprung this, um, this uh, honorary uh, arts degree. Uh, it was like oh, I'm was saying, well, you know, uh, we're preparing for this event. Could you do? Could I do it next year? But then I thought, well, maybe the, maybe if I'm going to get an honorary degree, uh, I just have to do less for the for yeah, the event. Than, the GBS, and, yeah. come. So Don drove me mm -hmm. uh, down. It's five hours from my place, and he. He's an exceptional photographer because he. I, I spent some time in France um, uh, with his buddy that they both uh, uh, served in the French Foreign Legion, mm. and I had a, a very great experience. I never dreamed I would get a chance to go to France. Matter of fact, I never dreamed I'd ever get a chance to go to the UK. Mm -hmm. But Stu through Stuart, mm -hmm. I was able to. The uh, the, the issue that that uh, uh, people would be willing to pay. For me to come mm. and and so and I get a lot of those requests, but I tell them I'm I'm too decrepit. Well, the last time I got a request, whoever it was, I kept upping the challenge. I, I said I have to bring a, bring a caretaker. <laughs> well, my son or my daughter yeah. would have to come. I had the, this and on and on all the requirements. I pushed the encouragers till they said, "Well, you expect that much from us, then." You know, they wanted me to be exclusive to them, mm -hmm. and that's the mistake because they didn't say, well, since uh, you know we, we had that that you're exclusive for us, and I said, oh, that's the wrong word, yes. <laughs> so I turned them down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said I was I said, well, they were willing to to pay for my son to come, or, or you know, they, they, most of my wife's relatives uh, on their father's side are, uh, you know, all the relatives are in Devon and. Mm -hmm. and on that so I had a chance finally to visit mm -hmm. my wife and daughter visited and then I visited mm -hmm. so so we got that, that in There's a lot of them have come uh, and visited us where right. we live mm -hmm. so it's kind of neat to be able to touch base yeah. with them and yeah. on and on so yeah. but the, but the uh, the issue is that that if I have to as I say if I have to use that uh, electrical cart mm. in Edson mm. 
I'm not going downtown anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got enough books. And, yeah, I was going to say you've got enough books and to I'll last focus you. Yeah. And I'll be undisturbed to make, uh, you know, work with my son yes. to produce uh, Bushcraft 2, Bushcraft 3, Bushcraft mm -hmm. 4, and all the other type of... I might even write a book on knots. I, I've, got, I've written a book on uh, clothing. Mm. Because uh, when I wanted to write a chapter on clothing and survival, I couldn't find the book uh, suitable to derive. Mm. A lot of books on fashion, mm. but there's not that much on the physiology of the human body mm. mm -hmm. that requires the protection of the physics of clothing. Mm. And that's a subject that, that I sort of, I should get a PhD for that. Yes, indeed. On, on the yeah. sort of, so this, this book, would really be useful to a clothing designer, mm. but I had to write the book to be able to bone up on the issue of clothing mm. to the point that I could write a chapter of maybe 25 pages or something to do it properly. Because mm. I was, you know, I would derive stealing the ideas from a good book, mm. but that type of book, as far as I could tell, is, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. No. So we should expect some more writing from you at some oh, point. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm, um, I am. I've been saying this for about a year now that I better get with it. Um, I worked for 17 years to develop a program, uh, which I called ten Tangible Education, mm. uh, on how teachers uh, bring nature into the classroom. Right. And I figure that there's tremendous value. Uh, the suggestions that we give our teachers do that. Mm -hmm. If I don't write that down, mm. well, you know, I'd be in great remiss. And uh, and of all I know, that every teacher in Canada wants to buy that book, mm. and my son could, daughter could benefit from the royalties. So, so that's one thing. You know, clothing book, mm. this book on how to teach nature to to uh, the kids in kindergarten to grade mm. twelve. Uh, and there are a lot of things like knots. Everybody brings out a book. I got my idea on mm -hmm. ideas on knots. And I have about 150 of those booklets mm. to produce. Well, they're 32 pages, mm -hmm. and um, the kids get the benefit of, mm -hmm. you know, I can write the book that the 10 butterflies that, of the 10 butterflies I list in the booklet, nine times out of 10, that's one of the butterflies. So why not? Memorize that list so yes. you enjoy those butterflies. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. Yeah, there's a lot of things like that. that mm. I have yet to write a book called uh, Survival in the Summer. I've got mm. Survival when it's cold and there's no snow. Survival when the snow is uh, so deep you need snowshoes. Yes. And Survival with Kits, uh, mm. Kit, mm -hmm. how to compile the kit and, yes. and the rationale on how to extend your, your comfort by, you know, Super shelter fits in your parka pocket. Mm -hmm. You assume that you're going to have to uh, sleep in your clothes. Mm. So, you know, kilogram or kilogram and a half of shelter keeps you from having to buck up the amount of wood that you uh, would have normally in a lean to. Yeah. The wood is as wide as the width of your car, and the yes. pile is as the profile of the car. Mm. And that's on a daily basis yeah. that you likely, you might even find when it's four, 60 below, <laughs> maybe you'll be a bit short. So yeah. the dynamics of bucking up that much wood is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So try to develop a simple method. Of course, buy the best sleeping bags you could afford. Mm -hmm. But but then again, you've got to know how many bags you got to put because when you put on one bag, and it might be good for 40 below, but uh, but if it turns 60, you have to put a second bag on. And uh, and it might even be that it's got to be a third bag, but eventually you're going to be warm enough because you, <laughs> you haven't used enough bags. Mm -hmm. So the physics of, of a lot of that. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you've got so much enthusiasm still for sharing what you know and developing new ideas and writing them down and sharing them with the world. But... Can I just take this opportunity to thank you for everything My, you've done so far and shared with the world? It's very much appreciated, as is this time that we've spent together today. You've My pleasure. dedicated I was, an hour. I was hoping we would sit down. Yes. You're on the same sheet as me. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, well, well, I said, well, who is Lisa? Uh, 
And then I realized uh, that person I was looking at, <laughs> she was one of the <laughs> important people. I was in church. She's always looking at me so familiarly yeah. that she knows Stuart Goring. Yes. Uh, uh, well, we, we first met on that trip when you came over to visit that time with Stuart. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was good. You made those connections then. Yeah, yeah. And it's been an absolute pleasure to continue at this time as well so uh, well i hope it, coming all this way from the uk i hope it's worthwhile to the extent where you know some things are fun and so on but you're you got to dig, dig deeper in your pocket if well, you don't no it's been get very the, well said. the rever you know the the compensation that you're trying to accomplish mm. um you know sometimes you have a lot of fun you're a tourist but your wife says, how come we don't have butter on the table? <laughs> yes, that's true. We've got to find that balance. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been, it's been a fantastic uh, event, and thank you for, uh, for your time. Thanks, Morris. Cheers. Well, cool. Well, it sounds like dinner time. Next yes. well, that was an hour and 35 minutes, would you believe? Yeah. And we only just got started. <laughs> <laughs> well... I always tell the students, I said, 